Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to the REN21 Renewables Academy 2014 here in Bonn, a historic place and historic moment. May I introduce myself briefly? My name is Christian Stahl. I'm a moderator, journalist and filmmaker. I now live in Berlin. I just came from the um, great party of 25 years after um, the end of the war to Bonn, where I studied exactly in the year when the wall came down, 1989. Maybe it's a good coincidence um, to tear down another wall um, concerning the renewable energies um, together with you. Um, let me introduce, since it is a very international conference, uh, not only the, um, the audience here and the participants in Bonn, in this old former German Bundestag, um, but also um, our global audience on the live stream, because um, our conference, our academy uh, and birthday party will be um, shown and broadcasted in, well, in all the countries. Um, there are only three which is not able to see, but I don't tell you um, the, the names. That's a secret. You have to find out. Um, so uh, welcome, everybody. And I try to, since it is very international, uh, at least say hello in as many international languages as I am able to. So, bienvenue. Uh, Jin dobre, dobre dan. Assalamu alaikum, hoj gelinis, savatikab, bon dia, buenos dias, buongiorno, grüß Gott, guten Tag, und wie ist es, as we say in Cologne and Bonn, uh, how are you? So, I um, hope all of you are well. And this, in this um, building, I just heard from Christine Linz, in the basement, over there in a cafeteria, which still smells the cigarette smoke of the politicians, which they must have smoked uh, um, 25 years ago. The reunification of Germany was decided. In um, Cologne, we would say Klüngel. So this is sort of a secret decision uh, which is made here. So it's a very historical place where we're in, and uh, we're really happy to make this three days academy not only a conference with all of you, but also a birthday party of 10 years of REN21. Um, because in 2004, um, the idea of this conference, of this academy started, and now, 10 years later, um, we all know what renewable is, and we will discuss um, um, today and tomorrow how 100% renewable energy in uh, the world um, can be provided in the next, maybe, the next decade. Um, but it's going to be a conference, a very interactive one, where we want to, um, you to participate because it's going to be an exchange, uh, a networking session, a debate, and also a think tank, maybe also a rethink tank, how can we um, 
put more pressure on um, yeah, global economy and global thinking um, towards um, renewable energies. Um, and um, since it is interactive, we have a um, um, flying reporter here in the, in the, in the audience. Kanika, where are you? Could you just come, come, come to me in front? And also Sandra and Hannah for our international um, audience from live stream, would you just stand up? Ladies, no, uh, you have to come here because the camera has to see the two of you. I know um, at least all the gentlemen would now rather think they should moderate and not me. I'm very sorry, but they will help. So Sandra and Hannah will help to, if you have questions, international uh, questions from the live stream, the, you know, the, the two of you will help and Kanika will help me as a flying reporter here. Thank you very much, ladies. And um, yeah. Um, I used to study in Bonn 25 years ago, so it's an honor and pleasure for me to come back to the roots where my career started as moderator filmmaker and first of all um, give a warm welcome and I'm really um, pleased to, to now introduce to you the Deputy Mayor of Bonn, Gabriele Klingmüller. Welcome. Mrs. Linz, Mrs. Hoven, Mr. Stahl, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Bonn. I'm very happy to see you all here on the banks of the Rhine. I guess quite a few of you probably came here 10 years ago already, while some of you traveled to Bonn in the years after, and others might actually be here for the first time today. Looking back 10 years, we see Renewables 2004 taking place here in Bonn. This conference was the world's first government-hosted international conference on renewable energy. And it was one of the first large international conferences in Bonn to address a prominent aspect of sustainability. A lot has changed in the dissemination and perception of renewable energies ever since. At the same time, Bonn has developed into a hub for sustainability-related topics. Let me just highlight a few milestones on this pathway which Bonn has taken throughout the last decade. Numerous large international conferences have taken place in Bonn, to name just a few of them. 2008 saw the ninth conference of the parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity, in short, Biodiff Conference, with more than 5,000 particip participants identifying significant new measures to strengthen international networks and expand protected areas. In 2009, the UNESCO World Conference on Education for Sustainable Development took place here. The 1,000 delegates passed the so-called Bonn Declaration, attesting the importance of education for sustainable development. In the run-up to Rio Plus 20, 600 experts from all over the world convened in Bonn to develop policy strategies focusing particularly on the interconnections of the nexus from the economic, the ecological and the social dimension. You also may have heard of the Global Media Forum, Forum an annual Bonn event organized since 2008 by Deutsche Welle, Germany's international broadcaster. Every year it focuses on another topic in the field of media and globalization. This year's forum, forum, forum brought up over 2,500 people from 132 nations to Bonn. And of course, I should also mention the climate negotiations of the UN Climate Secretariat, converting our city into a location of high-level climate summit at least once a year. Through these, these conferences and many more, impulses have been sent from Bonn into the global debate over the years. However, of all conferences, Renewables 2004 has had a very special impact for Bonn and for the world. The REN21 network is a very concrete result of the Renewables Conference. Another one was the establishment of IRENA, which had been called for in the concluding resolution of the 2004 conference. When IRENA was officially founded in Bonn in January 2009, this meant a significant milestone 
for the world's renewable energy deployment and a clear sign that the global paradigm was energy paradigm was changing as a result of the growing commitments from governments around the globe. And I'm very happy that one of IRENA's institutions, the Innovation and Technology Center, has become part of BAN's institutional sustainability landscape. Nowadays, you find more than 1,000 international staff working in the 18 UN organizations in Bonn, engaging in sustainability worldwide. Amongst them are the Climate Secretariat, the Secretariat to Combat Desertification, and the Volunteer Program of the United Nations. They are surrounded by a cluster of federal ministries, scientific institutions, and some 150 NGOs, all active in related fields. This globally engaged community has grown substantially over the last years. Amongst the newcomers to Bonn are the Global Crop Diversity Trust, for instance, and IPBES, the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And I'm sure quite a few of you have ties to other Bonn-based institutions and organizations in one way or another, such as the World Wind Energy Association, ICLAI, or Eurosolar. Thus, within a range of a few kilometers, you find more than 4,000 people who have committed to improving global standards for the environment, climate, development, and peace. Here in Bonn's old waterworks, used by our national government as the Federal Plenary Hall from 1986 to 1992, you are right at the heart of this network. I hope that in your conference sessions and in your discussions, you may experience the special spirit of uh, this very dense network in Bonn, a spirit of open-mindedness and mutual understanding, a spirit that unites many different actors and approaches, a spirit that leads to some fresh thinking. As Deputy Mayor of Bonn, I see the striking change that have happened in the renewable energy sector substantial changes on the ground. After all, the local level plays a substantial role in energy supply and promotion of green energy. Thus, I'm very interested to hear about the outcomes of our, your conference. I wish you very fruitful discussions and every success for advancing the global renewable energy agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Klingmüller, the Deputy Mayor of Bonn. Um, let me be honest to you, I'm a sort of scared to introduce the next um, lady to you, not only because she's one of the most powerful uh, women in German government, but it's also difficult to introduce the whole name of her ministry correctly in English. So I hope, Ingrid Hofen, I don't make too many mistakes. Please welcome with me Ingrid Hofen. She's the General Director of the Federal Ministry of Economic Development and Cooperation. Thank you very much for being here. Dear Mrs. Gabriele Klingmüller, Deputy Mayor of the City of Bonn, I know that Arturo Servus, who has played such a key role for this network, is going to join us later, but I also want to extend from my perspective a warm welcome from my ministry to Arturo Servus and Christine Linz. Thank you so much for your support uh, for making this meeting um, a success. I'm, I'm really quite confident that it's going to be a great success. Um, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to welcome you all on behalf of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, <laughs> almost, <laughs> to the first REN21 Renewables Academy here in Bonn. You are the family members of a very important and growing network, some of you have been participant of this network for many, many years and have brought a lot of energy to, to this joint endeavor. So let me not only welcome you, but let me upfront thank you so much for what you have um, brought to, to, this, to this network. 
Ten years ago, with the International Renewable Energy Conference in Bonn, I think we all together set a milestone towards the global dissemination of renewable energies. Over 3,000 high-level participants from all around the world came together to reach for solutions to overcome the challenges of achieving a sustainable renewable energy future, which industrialized nations, developing countries, and economies in transition face until today. The Renewables 2004 conference in Bonn provided the lead example for a range of successful international renewable energy conferences in Beijing, Washington, Delhi, Abu Dhabi. These conferences have become a major political format in the international discourse of renewable energies. In addition, these conferences provided a great platform for the private sector to exchange internationally and regionally, as well as to introduce latest technolo technological innovations in the field of renewable energies. I'm delighted to know that the next conference will be hosted by South Africa in October 2015. To some extent, then, this conference go back to the very roots of the creation um, of this renewable energy network. Um, some are nodding. Perhaps you do remember when we gathered in 2002 in Johannesburg for the Rio Plus 10 Summit, we were approaching the last nights of really entrenched discussions um, and negotiations about the text. The remaining text, which was of utmost importance, especially to, to my government, it was the one on energy. And unfortunately, somehow, as it is, I mean, you have to strike a compromise. And unfortunately, the compromise was as a very low denominator, common denominator. And our chancellor was arriving to Johannesburg, and we were wondering, what's next? I mean, what could be actually the message to give a positive spirit when we all go home from Johannesburg after having worked so many months in really to have a good result, especially on energy transition? And we gathered together with a couple of stakeholders, NGOs, the private sector, and we said, look, why don't we create a club? A club of those that really want to move forward towards renewable energy. And why shouldn't our chancellor invite to Bonn? So overnight, actually, before he arrived in Johannesburg, the, the speech was redone. It was shortened to at least, I mean, it was not even three minutes long. And it had two ingredients. Actually, the invitation to come to Bonn for a renewable energy conference and to take it from there to make the transition um, a reality. And many of you have joined us in this endeavor. So coming back to this network actually reminds me of very important first steps. And we, but at that time, we have never dreamt um, about the success that this could have and the growing, growing alliance um, on renewable energy. Germany has closely accompanied and encouraged the development of REN21 to become a key international player, which aims at increasing the large-scale deployment of renewable energy worldwide. Today, REN21 significantly contributes to relevant information exchange and research-based analysis. The network further offers a platform for interconnection between multi-stakeholder act actors, as we see this in the room and I've just said. Let me especially highlight the REN21 flagship publication, Renewables Global Status Report. It has become the international conference document which outlines and analyzes the global development of renewable energy sources. The Renewable Global Futures Report, first launched in January 2013, has the potential to become another pillar of the work of REN21. And the report innovatively highlights current and future trends and challenges in the fields of renewables. Over the last 10 years, we have seen that countries such as Denmark, or even Cap Verde, set visionary targets of 100% renewable energy. 
quite a number of cities, regions, and small island states, for instance. Cities like Frankfurt or Samsung are even further ahead. And the transition to entirely renewable energies has become a reality. Since 2004, worldwide installed renewable energy power has increased by 85%, although from a very low basis. Even in China, for the first time installed, even China last year, for the first time installed more renewable energy power than conventional power. And investments in renewable energy um, in 2013 was at remarkable 214 billion US dollars compared to 50 billion in 2004. Almost the half of this investment is taking place in developing countries. Not to disregard the social impacts of renewable energy, as the rate of employment in the renewable energy sector doubled over the last 10 years from 3 million to 6.5 million employees. 10 years ago, we hoped that this could be reality, but certainly the progress of this kind and this magnitude was almost unthinkable. However, when we look at current studies and reports and even recall our own experiences with the so-called German Energiewende, more needs to be done in order to make really global energy transition happen. Because if you look at the global share of renewables um, in final energy consumption, in 2012, this is the later figure that, that we got, is, it was just at 90%. And 10 years ago, it was at 17%. That means we still have to work harder, really, um, to make renewable energy a bigger part of final energy consumption. And at the same time, we have to acknowledge that still an estimated 1.3 billion people worldwide remain to be without access to electricity for their daily needs. We all know this. Energy poverty has major consequences, um, has major consequences for those affected and poses a significant challenge to sustainable de development. The quality of life depends so much on energy provision, education, and income generating opportunities are constrained if, if you face a lack of energy, especially in the poorer regions, in the more rural regions of less and least developed countries. Especially rural electrification where the main electricity grids do not reach, this remains to be a major issue for many countries in the years to come. So absolutely, the challenge in front of us is actually to give, as soon as possible, access to modern and clean energy to as many people as possible. But at the same time, if we think about energy provision, we have to do this in a way that we respect the planetary boundaries, which means we have to observe by any means um, our goal to not exceed global warming by two degrees Celsius. If I look at what you have achieved in your network, if I look what academia tells us and think tanks, when I look what actually is already underway, when I look at the goals of the Sustainable Energy for All initiative, I think we should come to the conclusion that this is feasible. 100% renewables and energy provision by 2050. Is this really vision, or shouldn't we actually concentrate our power, our energy, our knowledge, and really to make it happen? It is feasible to our understanding, and we need it desperately if we want really to make things happen on both ends, access to energy and maintain the planetary boundaries. Our minister, Gerd Müller, he is absolutely supporting these endeavors. He has become a member of the Advisory Council of Sustainable Energy for All. The ministry has set a very ambitious goal that under the umbrella of the Sustainable Energy for All initiative, 
We have committed ourselves that by the year 2030, we from German Development Corporation want to support energy access for an additional 100 million people around the globe. And in the energy sector, energy provision, but especially the promotion of renewable energies is one of our most important sectors in cooperation with developing countries. Only last year, our commitment achieved 1.9 billion in euros. Um, in addition, we have initiated a couple of regional initiatives. I think we have to bring the spirit that now gathers in Bonn, spirit that gathers at the core of many conferences that Mrs. Klingwiller has uh, absolutely rightly mentioned, new institutes, new think tanks. I think we have to bring the spirit um, to, to the regions in developing countries. We have to create another level of reassurance that the transition is feasible. And then be the developed world, stand at the sides of those who need additional support to make it happen. Therefore, for instance, the German Development Corporation supports UNIDO to establish re regional renewable energy and energy efficient centers to promote sustainable energy services. Let me particularly mention the ECOWAS Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency in West Africa and the Regional Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency in the Arab region. I think those two are very prominent examples for valuable regional efforts. We have a very important year just ahead of us. Um, the 10th anniversary of the Renewable 2004 Conference, your gathering here in Bonn, is at the very beginning of a decisive year. Next year, we are going to finalize our work on the Sustainable Development Goals and the post-2015 debate. And of course, we have to make sure that access to sustainable and modern energy has a key role within this new goal set. Additionally, we are heading towards Paris COP21 and a very decisive step really to make sure that the future climate contract gives to all of us, to the people in the South and to the people of the world, the hope that we can live within peace and stability because we respect the planetary boundaries and we adjust our economic and social development in the way that it doesn't actually need a second planet. You have the ideas and the tools and the instruments. We want to provide you with a platform to make it happen, and we count on your support for the many important things that we have to achieve in the next 12 months. Thank you for coming to Bonn. Thank you for supporting this very important endeavor. I wish you a very good conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ingrid Hofen for this inspiring and motivating speech, talking about this spirit of the Club of Bonn. Um, if I did my homework right as journalist and moderator and my research is right, Christine Lenz and her team from RAN21 didn't sleep too much in the last six weeks, maybe as much as you normally do in um, six days. Um, not only for this reason, but of course um, for bringing all of you and us here together to this Club of Bonn, as you said. Um, Welcome, give a warm welcome to Christine Lenz, Executive Secretary of REN21. You all know her. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Christian. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Hofen, Mrs. Klingmüller, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today and to see so many familiar faces celebrating with us, uh, looking back at uh, the successes of renewables of the decade ahead, but even more important, brainstorming about the future uh, that we have ahead of us, because as Mrs. Hofen has clearly said, we have achieved a lot on the one hand, yes, but we still have a lot to do to get uh, renewables uh, to the share in the energy mix uh, that uh, they deserve. So, uh, we have seen that and we've heard that in the last decade uh, many things uh, have happened and today the situation of renewables is not anymore as we had it in 2004. 
Uh, yes, you were right. You said that the, the share in final energy consumption increased only from 17 to 19 percent. But when you actually uh, look at uh, primary energy supply, their renewables uh, have increased from about 60 exajoule to uh, 76 exajoule. That is an increase uh, by 30 percent. Uh, we are making progress, but we also must, of course, bear in mind that energy demand in the world is rising, and so it is uh, difficult, uh, even more difficult for renewables uh, to increase their share, and I think that shows us also that if we are serious about uh, the 100% renewables, we must not forget energy efficiency in the equation, and we really have to put all our cards on both the uh, demand and uh, the supply side. I think that we have seen in the last decade uh, many scenarios uh, that were actually uh, achieved, uh, that, uh, targets that were achieved uh, before um, they were actually uh, set. We see costs have come down, and we see also throughout the decade that support policies have spread throughout the world. In 2004, renewables uh, was, um, were mainly concentrated in Europe and in the United States. Nowadays, uh, we can really see that uh, the virus ha has infected uh, many countries all around the world. We have about 144 countries all around the world with renewable energy policies uh, and targets in place. Uh, we find renewables nowadays on all continents uh, and countries uh, develop them according to different speeds and also according to uh, different drivers. Some of them uh, consider security of supply more important, uh, some of them industrial creation, and of course uh, environmental concerns are uh, also of importance there. Uh, we have actually, uh, for the occasion of this uh, event here today, we have uh, developed um, a publication uh, looking on uh, the first deco decade of renewables. You should have all received a copy, if not, uh, go and uh, pick it up. And there we actually uh, try to, to portray uh, the developments in, of renewables in the different regions. And I think this is really a key message that is very important. It's not any more an exclusive club of countries um, who, who develop renewables, but it's, it's a global uh, initiative and it's an, a global endeavor. Uh, as you see on this slide, renewables have done really well, I would say, in the power sector in the last decade. Uh, we have nowadays a situation that 26% of uh, global power generation capacity is renewables-based and about 22% of global electricity is produced uh, from renewables. Variable renewables achieve high shares in the uh, energy mix, uh, in the electricity mix of countries, and I think it is striking to see that uh, a country like uh, Denmark uh, nowadays supplies 33% of its uh, electricity from wind, and uh, Spain, 21% from, from wind, and Italy, 8% uh, of electricity from PV. So these are examples, and I think these are encouraging examples, also showing us that high shares of renewables, despite uh, some of the arguments that, o that are often put forward, um, can uh, be integrated and can be integrated uh, to a very large extent. Also, when looking at uh, capacity additions by technologies, we clearly see that uh, there is a, um, a huge increase in many sectors. Yes, in the power sector, renewables have done uh, very well. However, when we look at heating and cooling, we see that there is only a small uh, growing, but still small share of renewables, um, of heat uh, generated by renewables. Approximately 10% of global uh, heat demand is coming uh, from renewables, and I think if we are serious about 100% renewables uh, in the future, we have to um, give great attention in the future to the heating and cooling sector because um, there, there are lots of possibilities, but there are also uh, lots of uh, challenges in the way. We are going to have a, a session uh, later on today to debate this. And also when it comes to transport, yes, uh, liquid biofuels uh, provide solutions. Uh, we have more and more countries uh, investing in initiatives linking electric transport uh, to uh, renewables development, but still there is also uh, quite a way to go. Now, as you all know, not only from football, people are highly competitive. And I think whenever I go somewhere and do a presentation, this slide actually showing how the different countries are doing is always attracting a lot of attention. And of course, when you look at absolute investment numbers, 
annual investment uh, in renewable power capacity uh, in the world, you have the champions, you have China, you have the United States, Japan, the United Kingdom and Germany. But uh, this year, for the first time, uh, we did an exercise that we put uh, investment relative to GDP. I see someone, the, the godfather of the idea, uh, nodding behind there. And there you actually see uh, that you uh, get a completely different list of countries. So suddenly, the, uh, the, the, um, the top five uh, reads Uruguay, Mauritius, Costa Rica, South Africa, and Nicaragua. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, this is very encouraging because it shows the rapid development and the rapid deployment of renewables in uh, em emerging economies and developing countries where energy demand uh, is growing and where there is really a need to, um, to change uh, the, the equation. So, um, Mrs. Hoven mentioned it, investment also significantly increased uh, over the, this last decade. Um, and if we take the number that 1.6 trillion US dollars were invested in the renewable sector in the last decade, I think this is something uh, which, uh, which gives some uh, weight. And you also see the increase from 40 billion in 2004 to 214 uh, billion in 2013. So uh, an increase of investment uh, by a factor of five. And of course, uh, this is the global numbers and the regions are developing uh, differently. So this investment is not spread uh, evenly uh, throughout the world. But I think it's, it's quite interesting to see that in 2004, India and China were roughly uh, at the same investment levels as far as uh, renewables is concerned. And uh, nowadays, uh, Eight years later, in 2012, uh, China's renewable energy market, as we all know, the champion in many areas, was tenfold than the one of India. So we can see actually that uh, policy commitments do make a difference, uh, and, uh, and we also see that, okay, although it is difficult at the moment, um, in, and there is a, um, a reduction in investment uh, in Europe, and uh, last year also in, in the United States, we see other uh, regions in the world emerging, investment uh, rising in Latin America, in Southeast Asia, and uh, in Oceania. And I think this is something that gives us hope, and through this gathering here today with people from all around the world, we just uh, had the welcome of our Japanese delegation, uh, welcome. Uh, we, we hope to also um, stimulate exchange and probably also uh, manage to motivate each other and, uh, and, and, uh, and get new ideas on, on cooperation. It was mentioned before, costs have significantly come down uh, over the last decade. And I think this is a very interesting slide because you see, uh, on the one hand, you see on the, on the yellow bar, you see the uh, solar PV uh, power capacity additions. And then uh, on the gray line, you see the annual global investment in solar PV. And even as global investment uh, declined by about 22%, new capacity uh, installations increased by more than 32%. And so we see for the first time that these curves are not going parallel, but they go in opposite directions, which clearly shows the technologies, the, the, the costs that have come down make the technology attractive for new markets, uh, again, um, in the emerging economies. Of course, uh, economic uh, opportunities, job creation is something of importance. Mrs. Hoven made a reference to the figure. We had about 3 million jobs in 2004, and we have about 6.5 million jobs uh, in the renewable sector in 2013. Again, these are not evenly spread uh, all around the world. The countries with stable policy frameworks uh, are the ones uh, benefiting most. The jobs are mainly concentrated nowadays in the European Union, in China, in Brazil, uh, the United States, uh, and, uh, and India. I referred to it earlier. The virus of renewable energy has really spread. Uh, at least 144 countries with renewable energy policies and targets in the world. Here on the slide, you see the map of the world uh, indicating the, the number of policy measures and compa uh, comparison between 2005 and 2013. And you clearly see that fortunately there is more and more happening uh, in different parts. But of course, there are also still some uh, white spots on the map. So it is uh, clearly showing that we must not relax, uh, but we still have a lot uh, to do uh, to really make this uh, global energy transition happen. 
And I think also we must never forget that um, we still have a, a huge part of people on this planet living without uh, access uh, to energy. This is actually a picture that uh, I took uh, a, a week ago uh, when I was uh, with colleagues uh, in, in Cape Town for the preparations uh, of, uh, of CIREC. And, and there you see uh, the poorest of the poor uh, are still uh, in living in conditions that, uh, yes, sunlight would be there. There are now already new housing uh, built using uh, solar energy, but there is still a lot to do. And despite the fact that we have nowadays uh, business models and also technologies for access, uh, we see that we make progress on many continents, but we see still that on Africa, the growth in population uh, Electrified, the, 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 the population growth is still bigger than the growth in uh, population electrified. And in Africa, only 43% of the population have access uh, to electricity. So, still a huge way to go. And I think this is something that we must not uh, forget, especially when we talk about um, the 100% uh, scenarios and, uh, and this possibility. I think we can say, uh, in conclusion, that. Uh, the, um, uh, the world has changed in this last decade, and uh, today it's not anymore a question uh, on whether renewables have a role to play uh, in the provision of energy services, but rather how we can best uh, work together to increase the, the current pace uh, towards uh, achieving a 100% uh, renewables future. And, uh, and it's, I think it's a coincidence, but I think it's a very nice coincidence that this REN21 Renewables Academy coincides uh, with uh, the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Because I really believe that uh, it is ripe uh, to, uh, to tear down uh, walls, blocking uh, the global energy uh, transition, blocking the thinking, and uh, lead the way with energy efficiency and renewables. We are very excited to have you here with us. We hope that you will have a nice two and a half days. We have uh, put together a hopefully interesting and interactive program with long coffee breaks, uh, which you hopefully use to, to network, uh, to get to new people. We are very much looking forward uh, to hearing from you what you think are the key factors for uh, accelerating the global energy transition and uh, what should be our contribution over the next decade uh, to this. And uh, again, also from my side, of course, uh, REN21 is known for uh, these publications, the Global Status Report, etc. We could not be able to so accurately tell the story of renewables if we had not this great network of uh, more than 500 people from 80 countries all around the world who actively contribute uh, to these publications. In the course of uh, the next three days, we have about 200, uh, from 40 con 200 uh, people, contributors from 40 people here with us. And uh, I really look forward to uh, some inspiring discussion and debate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christine. And I have to find out in the next three days um, about your personal renewable energy batteries um, after six weeks without um, sleep. Such a speech. Thank you very much. I'll find out. Um, we have a little break now for about five minutes because we have to get some chairs here. Uh, and I would like to um, use this time for three things. First of all, a serious warning to all of you. Second, a personal remark. And third, the first interactive global study on renewable energies um, in Bonn. So, starting with the series warning. Um, the most of you have seen the, phot the, the photographer coming in. Um, we all need your photos. You know, we are um, living in the age of selfies. You all know what a selfie is. So, you don't have to take a selfie, but this is the warning. If you don't go to the photographer, you either get no lunch or I'll take a photo of you. So, better go there during the day and we tell you tomorrow why we need your photos. It's not presented on Facebook, only on Twitter. No, we need it for the conference. Okay, this was the serious warning. Second, the personal remark. You want to make this conference as it is not only a conference, but also an academy, a birthday party. Um, a think tank um, as interactive as possible. That's why we have a live stream here, but that's why we want to um, have the opportunity with so many experts from all over the world to um, 
that you participate in the conference. That's why Kanika will go around with a microphone. Don't get scared if I go around and ask you questions. I am German, but I'm from Cologne, so I'm not dangerous. You know, we invented the carnival. So I could, for example, go there and say, hi, how are you? Hi, thank you. Yeah, you? scared already? No, not really. Okay. Uh, but a little bit, you know, um, it's okay with the microphone, though, though I'm German? Yeah, that's okay. okay. Um, would you have thought that 100% uh, renewable energy is possible, like, let's say, 10 years ago? Not really. Not really. I think now uh, it looks more possible uh, with involvement of, of more countries and targets. What are your expectations towards this academy in three days? I think uh, my main objective is to meet as many people as possible. I've been contributing to, uh, to, to the reports, and it's nice to, to meet everyone involved. Thank you, Camilla. Um, you see, it's not too scary, as you can see. So I go to Johannes. How are you today? Very good, thank you. <laughs> um, you, all, you. You look a little bit scared. She didn't, but but you're not. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not scared. You're German too, it looks like. Yes. Okay. Um, what are your expectations towards this conference, this academy? Yeah, I also hope uh, to connect to a lot of people, have interesting discussions, and discuss um, how to make 100% renewables possible by 2050. Okay, thank you very much, Johannes. One last person. Um, whom do I scare now? Hi. Estefania. How are you? Fine, thank you. Not scared? No, no, yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. What would you think should be the, the result of such an academy as we have here? Mm, uh, for me, I expect to learn and networking with all people around and all the experts and apply this knowledge in my country. Where, where are you from? I'm from Ecuador, Latin America. Okay. Yeah. So, um, how was your trip here? Um, it was nice, but I studied here oh, okay. in, in Germany, and now I'm coming back next week. Okay, Good. so thank you. Stefania, thank you for having you here. So, that's what we will do today, tomorrow, to, to, together with Kanika. She will go around. She can collect questions, so you don't have to... Um, you can only raise your hands, so she, she can either collect questions, which we summarize and put on the panel, or you can raise personal questions. So please participate, don't be scared, just because it's your conference, your academy. This um, global first um, interactive study is only two questions to all of you, but since we're on the live stream, uh, it's sort of global and interactive, so I have two questions to all of you. The first is, whom of you thinks that 100% renewable energy is possible um, until 2050? Raise your hand. Who you think it's possible? Huh? Okay. Ah, oh, now, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, I, I think that's, being in the, in the former German Bundestag, that's, at least it's a majority, isn't it? So, Christina, we have won. <laughs> so, whom of you have thought this 10 years ago already? Should I trust that? <laughs> okay, that's not a majority, but some have some respect, yeah? but it's not a majority. So, you've seen, and Christina has um, emphasized it as well, um, I doubt that anybody in 1987 or 1988 would have believed that the wall would come down just only two years later. And after one decade of um, REN21, this inspiring club of Bonn, as we now have learned, um, has reached um, um, a great aim, not only to have you all here again in Bonn, but um, as you see, it became a majority <laughs> in the German Bundestag, in the former German Bundestag, that renewable energy is possible. And some pioneers already knew this 2004, so see where it gets us. And the question how to make 100% renewable energy possible is the main question of our first panel here. And now I have to go there. I always wanted to stand here where um, German Chancellor Helmut Kohl has stand. I think he has said because he was bigger than me, like this. But it's a good feeling. Um, but now, and uh, Christina, I have to steal your, um, if I no this one, sorry, um, to introduce the speakers to you. I'm sorry, I have to read it out. So um, first of all, um, welcome the keynote speaker of our first panel here in the Club of Bonn, Stefan Sänger from the Go 100% Renewable Campaign. Um, thank you for being here.
So we have the keynote first, and then I introduce the other speakers to you. Okay, this. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, it's a great pleasure indeed to be here this morning. Thank you very much for inviting us all. I know already many of you. It's a little bit like a family meeting indeed. I think somebody's mentioned that. And it's a special pleasure for me to be here because I guess I have the shortest way to come here. Our office is just 300 meters. Maybe PM said you are quite close as well, but I guess nobody from your end is here. Um, uh, that seems the case. So I'm here to present you an initiative that we have started as World Wind Energy Association. That is my main profession. Uh, and I'm on the uh, executive committee of the campaign that we have launched that I want to present you. So the question I wanted to start with is why do we want 100% renewable energy? And uh, there are, of course, several very obvious answers to this. One is this very well-known picture, obviously, mankind needs energy, mankind is utilizing energy, but not all of us have the same access to energy. That creates, of course, different and very big problems all over the world, especially in the dark areas. All of us we know, especially at this place, as the UN Climate Secretariat is just uh, located next door, that climate change is one of the largest challenges, the biggest challenges of mankind. You can see the CO2 uh, emissions here rising over the last more than century. But of course, this is just one kind of form of pollution. Um, there is direct pollution as well, as we know, air pollution. I've just returned from Beijing. Um, everybody knows, I think, this picture on the left side that the air quality used to be terrible. I was in Beijing last week, and now the sky is blue. So the people call that now APEC blue because the Chinese government has stopped half of the cars, most of the um, um, coal power stations, because of the APEC summit that takes place now in Beijing. And the result is, yes, everybody can see there is blue sky still. So they call it now air pollution eventually controlled. And the color is APEC blue. That was a nice story, of course. We know the problems of, also I would say, pollution coming from nuclear power. And on the right side, um, something, a picture taken place just 30 kilometers from here. One of the largest, I think it's the, the biggest uh, lignite mile, uh, mine of uh, Europe. Um, it's 10 by 7 kilometers, huge, huge. I would call this also kind of pollution, destruction of the landscape. Um, we know there are not only problems of pollution, but also there's big problems with economics of our energy system. And a very big problem is the fluctuation of fossil resources. It's not only nice to see the prices going down sometimes, like at this point of time, but that creates problems because we don't know what the price will be, of course, tomorrow or in five years. So this line is really not predictable for anybody. And that costs additional money because, well, of course, we have finance sector has also developed financial products for that, but it's an additional expense for us. So obviously, the key drivers for renewable energy are renewables are a secure domestic energy source, practically available everywhere. They are environmental friendly, practically well, no emissions, and they are low risk and they are affordable. But why has there not been more progress made over the last, well, let's say not only 10 years, over the last 20 years or 30 years when the commercialization has started? We discussed this, of course, like many of you at many occasions, and at one of the UN Climate Change Conferences, the one in Doha, we had a side event where we demonstrated examples of 100% renewable energy communities, and that that side event, the idea was born that the focus of these discussions should not be on burden sharing, reduction of emissions, but on the opportunities. So people raised the idea of of course, we as I'm from the non-governmental sector, we cannot have a direct impact on the negotiations. But let us launch a campaign that is demonstrating that renewable energy is possible and it also brings many benefits. What is 100% renewable energy? At first, I would just call it it's a symphony of the renewables. All the renewable energy sources that we have, which is mainly, of course, solar power, wind energy, hydropower, bioenergy, and geothermal energy. 
we've set up this campaign with three main goals. First is the energy supply of the world should be based 100% on renewable energy in all sectors. And also now coming back from China, I have again learned that actually it should not only refer to power, heating, cooling, transport, but even I was at the World Non-Grid Connected Wind Energy Conference, there are other options that are indirectly related to energy, for example, material. I know that there is some uh, research going on at Aachen University where researchers try to find out how to use wind power, for example, to make plastics with the energy and with CO2 that might be in the air. In China, they are researching now how to make proteins out of wind energy together with maybe CO2. The basic principle that we also discussed, and we discussed quite long whether as a campaign we should have a target year, and then we decided no, because it's a matter of political choice. So when we ask, is it possible, it depends on many factors. But the first and main factor is, what do we want? So that's why you can easily say, yeah, 2030 would be possible, but if the people don't want it, if the decision makers don't take the right decisions, we will not go there. So that's why we say as a campaign, let's lobby for, from now on, only new investment in renewable energy. And the third important part of this is what we see all over the world is often the solutions are emerging on the local level, they are applied on the local level, and that is, of course, also where renewable energy is offered. I mean, every village has sun, has, almost every village has also um, solar uh, wind. So encouraging local solutions, that is certainly a promising approach to come to 100% renewables. So how do we reach that again? How do we reach that choice that we want, that change that we want? Again, the answer is we have to focus on the symphony of the renewables so to make clear that every renewable energy source should play and has to play a role in a new energy supply system of the future. And what we want to do is inspire the change by inspiring the debate about how to reach that. Realizing the benefits of a 100% renewable energy supply, making it clear that when we switch to renewable energy, again, it's not a burden. There are so many benefits coming from that. Energy access is in the center because, again, the sun shines everywhere and nobody can stop the sun from shining. Maybe I heard that on 20th of March we will have an eclipse here in Europe. Then for half an hour or so there will be no sun, but that is, in, aside from, of course, during night, the sun will shine every day. So there are so many benefits we have to talk about, which are, of course, already reality in many parts of the world. So the next part is, and that's also a key aspect of it, learning from best practice, learning from those examples, from those cities, from those communities, from those countries that have reached already 100% or have a plan to go there. Now here you see a screenshot of the Danish energy grid, the electricity grid operator, Energinet.dk. That was on 9th of February, but Denmark had 100% of its power coming from wind. And this happens from time to time. I just got the news that Scotland in October had more than 120% of its power, so more than what they used in October coming from wind power. And also I learned a few days ago that Denmark is planning to have a 200% of the power capacity that they need installed as wind power. So they want to have four or five times as much wind power as today because the Danish government has officially said that, yes, we will need to use wind also in other areas like heating, cooling, like the transportation sector. So this really shows us the way we can go. This campaign has, in order to identify such places, set up a world map. And this is just the start of it. It's just still growing. Um, you are invited, if you know such, of course, cases, to visit the website and also add your um, examples if you have some. But we are collecting here examples of communities, regions, and we are about also to uh, develop with partners a global network of municipalities around the world 
that have reached that or are on the way to 100% renewable energy. You can see here the alliance that has been created. So the secretariat of the uh, campaign is currently hosted by the World Future Council. Um, we have a number of so-called industry associations. It's the World Bioenergy Association is one of the partners, uh, the International Geothermal Association, ourselves as World Energy Association, also International Solar Energy Society. We have, from science, we have uh, some of the leading research institutes. We have uh, the Sierra Club, the largest environment organization of the United States, which helped us a lot to make the message visible at the Ban Ki-moon Summit in September in New York, where the Sierra Club members held 2,000 signs with the logo of the campaign. So we got some good media coverage at that. Again, the idea to increase this network and to spread the message and to inspire a discussion. We have a number of projects, more specific projects, we're about to create an international network of 100% renewable energy regions. A key partner in this will be ECLE. ECLE, well, I'm not sure whether somebody from the bond secretariat is already here, but um, ECLE is doing a lot of important work and we want to work together with them focusing on 100% renewable energy networks. Of course, um, the general network, we have the world map that I just briefly presented. There's a group of international ambassadors, which includes, for example, David Suzuki from Canada. The latest one who has agreed to be an ambassador is uh, Manika Gandhi, Indian minister, former minister for environment, um, and a number of other um, high-level and well-known personalities. We're about to establish a scientific panel to make clear that this is based on science. We are not kind of only believers in something that doesn't exist, but we have strong scientific reasons for what we are aiming at. So in this sense, I thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to these discussions here. And I would like to thank you, Christine, personally, for giving us the opportunity to present this initiative. Again, it is a process, I think, um, the more of you join this discussion, the more, of course, powerful it gets. You see here uh, Facebook, Twitter, the website accounts where you can get more uh, information about the campaign and of course everybody as I said is invited to join. Thank you very much. We have to thank you Stefan for the, for the keynote uh, and um, yeah, let's start with the, with the debate now. Um, so um, let me introduce and welcome uh, uh, which one? This one? Okay, yeah. yeah. Ah, okay. Ah, now I understand. So you're on the left side, but this is only geographical, not political. It's just your own decision. Okay, so Stefan Zenger is here. So um, let's welcome with me Atul Raturi here on, a, on the plenary. He's from the um, University of the South Pacific. Welcome to Bonn. Okay, and then we have Imani Kumar. He is from uh, ICLE. Welcome, Imani. Bring it a long way as well. Yeah. Well, uh, now you yeah, sit down. Ah, okay. There we have. There we have the problem. Ha ha. Da -da -dum. This is from. So, but we are, you know, like in the club of Bun, we have some spirit. That's fine. So, uh, who else is like? Who's missing there? Ah, ah this, is the, this is the trick for me that I, uh, that, that I should see, not see him. Okay, so um, on the far left, but this is only geographical, not political, Eberhard Waffenschmidt. Please welcome him. He's from the Cologne University of Applied Science. So, uh, who else is? No, oh, now we have everybody. Okay, ah, Stefan Singer. Okay. No, I get con confused. Gsenger. Uh, Stefan Gsenger? Singer. Sing. Sing. Ah, okay. Get confused with all the. Yeah, yeah. We have like one Stefan is missing, one Stefan is here, and one is still to be welcome. Stefan Singer from WWF. Now we have it. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so, all right. And finally, 
sit down myself. We have um, a lot to do, gentlemen. So we, um, as Christina just said to me, we're gendered. First, we had only three women to welcome all of you. Now the discussion is. Um, ah, now it's getting better. We sit team. Only gentlemen uh, on the panel, but we have Kanika. Um, so you can raise questions. So she's our um, um, flying reporter. So all the questions you have, please don't hesitate to raise. Um, I would like you, gentlemen, to introduce yourself and your initiatives briefly towards the question how to make 100% renewable energy happen. We have a lot of questions to do and the main question of this first panel until the um, lunch break at 12.30 is um, to critically debate with all of you uh, whether this 100% re renewable future is really feasible and if yes, how? Because as we see, all of us believe in it or a majority believes in it. Um, in this um, old plenary um, um, room, but um, how is it possible? Let's start maybe with the one who was um, the last one to introduce, Stefan Singer. Um, take the microphone, I hand it over to you. Uh, maybe just in a brief five minutes, um, keynote, what's your perspective, your ideas? Yes, yeah, thank you. Um <clears throat> Well, WWF is a large global environmental NGO. Um, is fully committed to 100% renewables by 2050. Actually, we think about of uh, basically preponing a little bit and looking into a new study and looking whether it's possible to do it a little bit earlier. Um, given the dire needs, given the state of the climate, given the atmosphere, and given the, um, though um, quite controversial, huge growth of CO2 emissions. So it looks more difficult to do it earlier, but it's probably even more urgent to go earlier. Um, so we look into that one, so we fully support 100% renewables. We also believe that at this point in time, um, we are not very fond of having strong technological debates. There's a kind of tendency, I must say honestly, in the renewable energy movement to basically look at, and as important as it is, only at solar and wind to some extent, as important as they are, and dismiss other forms of renewables, which have some um, contentious issues. Hydropower, for instance, large hydropower, but also traditional biomass. We believe those need to be made more sustainable. So to get about almost 2.7 billion people out of the dirty, polluting, inefficient use of traditional biomass, it doesn't happen with getting rid of traditional biomass. I think we need to make traditional biomass much more sustainable, much more efficient, um, looking into biogas digesters, looking into energy efficient wood stoves, and then other, other renewables might play a role, such as solar cooking and so on. But I think it would be an illusion to believe that we can get rid of traditional biomass. Um, the same as with hydropower. We believe hydropower, we can get hydropower right. It can get wrong as well. Um, but it's interesting that a country like China, for instance, um, has currently one of the strongest laws domestically on saving water. It's often forgotten. Um, if you pollute water in China, um, than a couple of years prison, um, if not um, 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 lifelong prison, is threatening you. That those laws are not always complied with. It's a different issue. Um, but, but in terms of, of, of resource savings, China has one of the most efficient hydro power stations in this world. And I remember we were pretty much opposed to the, to the Three Gorges Dam 10 years ago. Actually, this was 12 years ago. It was built during the um, um, Johannesburg conference, we were pretty much opposed to that one, but we now realize that the Three, three Gorges Dam, if you look at the performance and the efficiency, is one of the most efficient in the world, and similar to the uh, hydro power stations in Norway or Sweden. Um, so I think it can be done, and this is important for China, because China's investing a lot in hydro power in Africa, where the standard currently is not as good as it could be. So I think we need to look in that one. That's, that's my starting point. Um, one thing is important for us um, as well, if you look into um, the recent assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which concluded last week its new fifth assessment report, again, a book of 5,000 pages, I'm not going into detail here, and they said the first time, the the first time they did this one, they said by 2070, it's not 2050, yeah? but by 2070, we need to phase out fossil fuel emissions. It's the IPCC, it's not the Renewable Energy Club, the global one. Huh? You, have, you, have you have governments in there, agreed by governments, which are in many cases, embracing, supporting, financing fossil fuels. They're not there yet. It's a compromise, it's a consensus. That by 2070, if we want to stay below two degree. It's the first time they used the wording, basically, phase out. In 2070, I don't think it's that far from 2050, 
But I think we're getting in the ballpark also internationally. I think that's, that's progress. It's not perfect, but it's progress. Keep in mind also that the IPCC is was comparably careful, um, they're technology neutral, on embracing other technologies such as CCS or nuclear, which might play a role in that kind of getting rid of fossil fuel emissions. They're pretty, and if you look at the current status of nuclear, nuclear very likely, simply from financial reasons, might not play that big role as people thought about 10, 15, 20 years ago, not only because of Fukushima, nuclear is going down actually. Um, the same with CCS. Even the IA, um, and they are a staunch supporter of the of the um, of CCS, do not do not believe the IA does not believe that that CCS will play a major role in the future in in, in changing the fact that we need to leave more than two thirds of fossil fuels underground if we want to stay below two degrees, simply because of commercial reasons. So in the end, what what remains is energy efficiency and renewables. And I'm thankful to Christina that you mentioned energy efficiency as well, which I think is a major, major ally of ours. I think we need to keep that in mind. So the IPC having said this once was quite interesting. While the IPCC agreed on that one, and we were, we were there at the press conference, Ban Ki-moon Ki was speaking, there was lots of tweeting going on. And the tweets came from a company called Peabody. You know Peabody? One of the largest coal company in the world, a US-based um, company which currently does a major adver advertisement campaign globally, and that reads perfect. If you read the, the advertisement campaign, overcome energy poverty for the poor, energy poverty is one of the biggest challenges for stable development, etc., etc. And, and they use all the right words. It all sounds great and wonderful until you come to the end. The solution is coal. And the guy they hired to work for them is Bjorn Lomborg. Probably you know this guy he's in Denmark, one of the uh, skeptical environmentalists. So, those guys getting nervous, and they set the tweets out during the press conference of Ban Ki-moon when the IPCC concluded their report. Lots of tweets from Peabody. Those guys getting nervous, and it's for me a good sign. It's a good sign. People were upset about the tweets by Peabody. Well, we switch them off, you delete them, but it's a good sign. These guys are getting nervous. Mahatma Gandhi once said, do you know that quote, and I love that, he said, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and the next step is you have won. I don't know where we are in this kind of you know, temp uh, 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 line. I don't know where we are. But I think we have passed the point where people laugh at us that we support 100% renewables. I think we are a step further. And that leads me to my second point, if you allow me that one. There's a fight ahead with all the good arguments to go for renewables, which are beyond climate change. And I, sh and I thank Stefan and also Christina to make the point. It's jobs, it's health, it's freshwater scarcity. Don't let's forget freshwater scarcity is a key issue also for shale gas and shale oil. Um, that, that's a key issue as well for many countries. All these arguments are not as good as the current arguments of the incumbents. Don't let's be naive. Those guys do not wait until they're being replaced. Yes, we have seen lots of investments in renewables up to 250 billion, including large hydro, in the last year. But we tend to forget 1.3 billion went into fossil fuels. They're growing as well. So the glass is half full and half empty. It's half full because renewables are growing, but it's half empty because investments in fossil fuels are also skyrocketing. And you add the 2 billion, you add the 2 trillion subsidies for fossil fuels, as assessed by the International Monetary Fund, then you have the full picture of where the interests are lying in that world, unfortunately. And I think we need to be aware of that, but all of us who fight for 100% renewables, that those guys are not waiting, that we take their business away. Those incumbents have interests to fight for. There's, there's investments and there's money at stake. Do not let's forget that one. And that's why we believe, and this is my last point, why we believe focusing on financing is so important project financing, getting the framework for financing for renewables in place. It's so important to get the, the, the arguments right, to get the, the investments right, and financing for renewables also means, and that's an, another campaign, to support divestment, divestment from fossil fuels, which we have seen increasingly coming up also at the Ban Ki-moon summit. And Ban Ki-moon himself said it at the IPCC press conference, and I was surprised that the UN boss went that far. And he must have seen, he must have seen the tweets by Peabody as well, because he said, he, he, he said on the press conference, out of the blue, and this is not the IPC report, he said, dear people in the finance sector, stop investing in coal, invest in renewables. That was Ban Ki-moon, or, or original quote. And I think with that kind of support from the highest level, um, I have a positive feeling, but I'm not naive. I think there's lots, lots of fights and, and uh, 
arguments ahead of us. We shouldn't be naive, and we need to be aware of that one. And then I, and I'm sure we can win that one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan Singer. Um, what a what an opening. Thank you very much. Um, and let me um, make this personal remark with such passionate fighters like you. Um, I can understand that a lot of people get nervous, these guys you mentioned, and that's good. So thank you very much, Stefan. We go on with Eberhard Waffenschmidt. Um, as you, Imani, just told me, you have um, had a discussion without the moderator, which is fine, and already um, made the roles. Who's, who, who's the next? But it's, it's, it's great because this was an international perspective from Stefan from WWF, and now Eberhard will go on with the national perspective on Germany, uh, maybe as passionate and fighting as you, and um, it's up to you. <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much, Eberhard. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, first, I would uh, explain um, who I am, because uh, in, the, in my biography, in the papers, um, I, I had only a few words to explain. And there I mentioned I'm a professor at the Cologne University of Applied Science, but I'm also a member of the Solar Energy Förderverein, which is in English society to promote solar energy. And this society promoted 100% renewable energies already 15 years ago. Yeah. And in 2006, I made, uh, um, I made a study for this society, how we could supply ourselves completely with 100% renewables. And I gave some, uh, quite a lot of presentations that year. And since that time, if a friend asked me, hey, Eberhard, do you really believe that such a high industrialized country with so few sun like Germany, do you really believe that, we, that such a country can supply completely from renewable energies? And then I say, no, I do not believe. I know that it is possible. And then I add, hmm, technically. Ah, yeah, this friend would say. It's too expensive, you're right. And then I add, no, I don't think it is a matter of cost. You can see, we can pay for it. And finally, it will be even more cheaper than the current solution. At least for our children and grandchildren. I think it's not a matter of cost. It's a matter of politics and business. Business because the whole landscape of power supply of energy will change to completely new actors. Last year, on this year as well, Germany could supply about one third of the electricity from renewable energy. That means Conventional power generation decreases by 30%. Can you imagine a big company which loses 30% of his revenues, of his turnaround, within several years, with the perspective of losing more every year by year? Can you imagine? what the management is supposed to do in that case. And I would reply to Mr. Singer, you mentioned Gandhi with these three stages. I think we are in the middle of the last stage of fighting. Yeah. And then I tell my friend, as you see, it's a matter of business. It's also a matter of politics. Whom does policy support? Do we really want to switch over? In that case, we need to set the frame conditions. In that case, we can show the world that a country like Germany would be possible to be supplied by renewable energy. If we can show that, this will be this example to the world. And then, to my opinion, there is no excuse for any other country not to go to renewable energies. So I see if you can, you know, if you ask about, well, what can a small country like Germany do? 
So our share in carbon emissions is that low, it doesn't play a role. I say, yes, it plays a role. Because we can give the example to the rest of the world. And that's the important thing. Yeah, he said, okay, that's right, but won't it be a big experiment to exchange, to transform our complete supply of energy to renewable energies. And I say, yes, it will be a big experiment. Nobody knows exactly how it will go. There are still some open questions, but finally I'm sure it will work out. But I prefer to be part of the experiment in going to renewable energies much better, much, I like it much more than being part of the experiment of ruining our world with carbon emissions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eberhard Wachenschmidt. Um, we go on with Imani Kumar. He currently oversees um, strategic development of ICLA in Asia region. Now he is in Bonn and um, yeah, you have the microphone, you have the power, Ho hopefully a renewable one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm uh, Imani Kumar from uh, ICLEI. Uh, the mayor of, uh, deputy mayor of Bonn was saying that we are just a few uh, blocks away. Our, our headquarters is here. And uh, Sifar is also talking about we are one of the few partners. My Bonn colleagues are not here, but uh, I'm, I'm, I know what exactly happening between us and 100% renewable energy campaign, which uh, we are talking about. Uh, I represent an organization called ICLEI. As I said, that it is an association of cities all over the world uh, with nearly 1,000 odd cities as our members. And uh, we are doing whatever, like we in the sense of the cities, I'm talking about on the cities front, uh, the cities are doing whatever they can do to achieve this 100% renewable energy. If you ask me personally whether it is possible or not, I'm a little bit skeptic around, though I have raised my hand also when he asked about like whether it is possible. Yes, it is possible. Uh, but I say that uh, with a lot of riders attached to that. Uh, because the cities, what they want to do, how they want to do, is, is also not easy that. But one point is very clear. It is utmost necessary for everybody. Either it's a city government or it's a national government or it's a citizen or anybody else. So. We are looking in that direction, uh, the city governments all over the world, and we have a lot of uh, uh, activities going on with the city governments in the world to achieve that, to achieve that 100% renewable energy. Uh, the mayor and the BMZ people are saying that in 2004, actually, we signed an MOU with the German government, and we, called, we brought in up the word called local renewables. How do we bring renewables at the local level, at the city government level, so that the cities can also contribute to, uh, to the, whatever you want to say that final output, it can be a, redu a reduction in the carbon emissions, it can be energy for all, it can be uh, efficiency in their resources, what they, they want to provide with the, for the citizens or the, for the communities. So whatever may be the final output, the city started looking in that direction and they have a lot of uh, actions going on on, on ground uh, which, which we are supporting them either to the technical front or to the uh, policy front or, or to the programs front. Uh, some of the ones which as part of the local renewables which we started in India and also uh, later on it gone up to the, uh, the Brazil. I'm happy uh, that the person who is just walking here uh, the one who brought in Mr. Subramaniam uh, as, as he was the, the secretary at the New and Renewable Energy uh, Ministry in Government of India, uh, who has really pushed for uh, a solar cities program in India. I think that is one of the pioneers uh, which started in Indian uh, uh, continent and which is now uh, growing it. They started with 60 cities, uh, whatever uh, he, he announced it as, as 60 cities. It's going on. Uh, now the new government is in place and they're talking about 100 smart cities, which I'll say the renewables or the, or the uh, local renewables is one of the main component uh, of those smart cities which the government of India is, is talking about. Uh, we also have another program which uh, in, uh, in Indonesia, in India, in South Africa, in Brazil, in four emerging economic countries. Uh, looking again maybe on the uh, low carbon front, uh, coming out with various actions at the city level. Uh, we are coming out with uh, uh, renewable energy actions, uh, what cities can do. Uh, 
to reduce their carbon emissions to achieve uh, low carbon within their cities. Uh, there are nearly 25 odd cities in these four countries uh, supported by, again, I'll say the various national governments and uh, financially supported by the European Commission, along with the UN Habitat as our technical partner, uh, the, the main partner. Uh, we, all these 25 cities are looking for actions and uh, on the renewable energy front also, I'll put it that, that way, and then linking it to the financing and implementation of those actions. So there is and there is another way of uh, uh, achieving the 100% renewables is, is happening on, on that. Uh, as part of this, I'll say again, I, uh, thank, thanks to Christina and, and other uh, speakers before, energy efficiency is one of the main component if you want to achieve that, and which is also part of this particular uh, action. I'll say that uh, WWF. Again, with WWF, we have another program actually on the Earth Our City Challenge. Uh, we are looking for nearly now 14 or 15 countries, various cities. We brought in it as a challenge uh, to see that uh, energy efficiency, renewable energy actions are taking place in these city governments. So that is, that is also another one happening uh, with, with various cities in, in nearly 16 or 17 countries on that. Uh, recently, uh, I think a week back, uh, we have launched another campaign in, in, in uh, China. Uh, through our East Asia office, uh, we called it energy safe cities, uh, energy resilient cities, which, which we, we can say that. Uh, three cities from China, three cities from uh, Japan, th four cities from South Korea, and, and also we have one city from Mongolia, actually, who have come together and say that we want to achieve 100% renewable energy uh, by 2030. Uh, that's their commitment. And we are really looking into that, how this commitment can take it forward uh, by maybe looking into various examples. I think some of the best practices which uh, are coming out uh, in, in the website, which 100% Renewable Energy Stephen has said that, maybe some of these examples can go into those cities and see that what, what we're really looking into is, is the networking of these cities so that one city can learn from the other city and achieve whatever they have achieved, like the other city has achieved, and this city can learn from them and, and take it forward on that particular front. So these are some of those initiatives which uh, the cities have started uh, looking into that. Uh, finally, I'll say that as my experience with last uh, almost now 14, 15 years working with the city governments all over the world, uh, the main challenge, I'll, I'll put, it, put it, is uh, the political willingness. The mayor of the city, if unless until he or she, the mayor, decides that, okay, I want to go ahead and make my city more 100% renewable energy. Uh, unless until if they commit, uh, it's not going to be, uh, I, I'll say it's, it's a rider, it's not going to be that easy to achieve that. So this is one thing, political willingness is, is the main point which I'll put it. The other one, I'll say that uh, policy framework, either from the national governments or from the international agencies. Yes, on September 23rd in New York, we have actually also launched uh, uh, compact of mayors, where uh, city mayors are coming and saying that, we, okay, we want to reduce the carbon emissions. But this is, this is another way to take it forward on that. Last but not the least, I'll say that the point which uh, my uh, fellow person has brought it out is the financing. Unless until you link your activities, you link your international financing to these renewable actions, I don't think... Uh, we can achieve the 100% renewable energy. So either from the private side, either from the uh, international finances, uh, whatever. I, I heard, like, I, I, I participate in a lot of these discussions on the international financing. At one front, they say that we cannot uh, disperse my, their amount. But the other front, the cities are really waiting for the finances to take it forward for implementation. So we need to do some sort of a little bit of matchmaking. And unless until we have those finances available to the city governments, they can't take it forward. And I just want to stop it here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Imani, for the speech. Since um, Gandhi was mentioned twice now, um, I'd like to ask you whether I pronounce it correctly, the only sentence I know from Mahatma Gandhi, which maybe um, has to do with the, this fighting passion from Stefan, but all of you is, Karo Yamaro, is it right? Karo Yamaro, do or die? No, it's not right, okay. I tried to, I tried to, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll test it again. Okay, uh, we come to um, Atul Raturi. He's an um, associate professor of physics at the University of South Pacific, where he works on solar photovoltaics, hybrid systems, and renewable energy capacity building. But this is right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Thank for you. being here, Atul. A very good morning to you all. 
Uh, I'll just give you an introduction of the University of South Pacific. It's a regional university. It is owned by 12 countries in the Pacific. So it's not a country owned. It's the only second university besides the University of Western Indies that is truly regional. So we are owned by 12 countries. Our students, about 27,000 of them, are spread out in 30 million square kilometers. So if you ask me what is your classroom size, I would say 30 million square kilometers. And they're all connected. And they're all connected through internet. And this is where our power problems come in. If you have a student sitting 30 million square kilometers away, uh, not, uh, for in, a, in a country, if he or she is not connected, if there is no electricity available for that student, that student can't get any education. So our interest is not only on the energy part of it, but the whole scheme of things, whole sectors. We do not look at energy as just energy per se. We are looking at health, we're looking at education, we're looking at all aspects. So it's very, very important. But now what kind of energy we're looking at? If you want to look at a place where there is no contest between fossil fuels and renewable energy, is come to Pacific. 10 million, 10 million people is spread out in about 80 million square kilometers, 22 countries and territories, thousands of islands. There is no grid. There is no question of having a grid. Distributed renewable energy-based systems are the only solution. So if you, if you really want to go for these kind of you know, renewable energy where it is going to be straight away, 100%, we should go now, these, these are the regions. Uh, if I talk about the problems they face, number one, extreme dependence on imported petroleum fuel. Now, if you look at the petroleum intensity of some of the countries, like Kiribati and Nauru, you find that they are 100%. There are no, no countries in the world where 100% petroleum intensity. Uh, ADB and UNDP did some calculations, so they came up with this oil price vulnerability index, OPVI, and they found among the 10 top countries with highest OPVI, seven were, in Papua, uh, seven were in Pacific Island countries. Any fluctuations in the international market makes the economy go haywire. A large amount of their GDP goes into importing fossil fuels, which is coming from all over the world. So any disruption, there have been cases where countries run out of fuel. In 2004, Tuolu ran out of, ran out of fuel. Imagine a country without fuel for four months or five months. So these kind of situations will not happen in bigger cities and bigger countries. But these small countries, which are hidden from the main, you know, main side of the world, these things are happening. And it's very, very important that we look at this. Second thing is electricity access. 10 million people out of 10 million, 6.7 are in Papua New Guinea alone, but the rest of them are in other 21 territories and countries. And almost 70% people are without electricity no electricity of any kind. Now, they cannot have grids. The only system, as I talked about, will, will have renewable energy-based distributed systems. So a lot of opportunities. The third thing is climate change impacts. For, uh, Pacific Island countries, everyone knows that. They are at the forefront of Pacific, uh, the climate change. Every day there is a new story. Every day communities are being moved out from their traditional homes and they move to other places because the home have, homes have been inundated with water and salt water coming into the food crops and those kind of things. So it's happening every day. So it's very important. They generate only 0.03% of greenhouse gases of the whole world. But they bear the impact. And they can see that what is happening around them. So the leaders, I think there's a lot of awareness now, a lot of talk goes. And last year, the leaders and the, the, the ministers, everyone came around the place called RMI Marshall Island in Majuro. They came around and they said, we have to take leadership. And they call this climate leadership. And they said, we are going to be the leader. We're going to show the world how we can reduce our climate you know, uh, impacts. And uh, besides adaptation, can we do something about mitigation? So they sat down, and all the countries have come up with their targets now. So all the Pacific Island countries have their renewable energy targets. Now, it varies from country to country. Like Fiji has, uh, by 2015, they want to have 90% renewable while Cook Island would like to have 100% by 2020, and Nauru would like to have 50% by 2015. The numbers look good, but sometimes it is, it is very, very important that we look a bit more in detail. We find out how they're going to achieve them, whether these numbers are realistic. In case of Fiji, it might be possible. It is possible because they have a lot of hydro. So 70% comes from hydro. They can build up a lot of uh, sugarcane waste is there, so they can quickly build it up. And for them, it's easy to get 90%. That's all right. 
But some other countries, if you go to a small island country, a tall country, no trees, it's flat like a paper. You can't have any hydro. So the only way out is solar. Now, you would have to design systems with the storage, with the proper recycling systems to get them solar. So you have to look at each country, these 22 countries, in their own perspective and design systems which are suitable for them, and then come up with targets. It's good to have targets, but it's important to have them scientifically and you know, properly checked whether they are feasible or not. Or if not, then what to do? Uh, an example of this kind is Tokelau. Tokelau is a, a territory, and they have just gone. In fact, this is the first country that they tout as the first country which is almost 100% renewable. The three atolls, and they have uh, about one megawatt, three kilo, three, uh, 300 kilowatt each in each atoll, and everything is renewable. All the electricity, all their needs are being looked after by renewable energy. So that is one country, one te country or territory which is almost 100% uh, renewable. And that could be an example for other countries. And it's happening now. Samoa is bringing up about four megawatt of renewable uh, solar systems. Uh, Fiji is going big way. Tonga has one megawatt. All the countries have energy policies where they're bringing in tax incentives, they're bringing in special loans, low, low interest loans. So all these incentives are already there. Uh, private sector can play a very big, big role in this. And one example is in Fiji, where one of the companies, it comes in and it, say, it goes to businesses, says, okay, we'll install, operate, maintain a solar PV system for you. Only thing you have to do is to pay your regular electricity bill. And people like it. And they've already done about two megawatt, up to two megawatt system, they're still doing it. And lots of supermarkets and shopping centers and uh, resorts have gone that way. So it is happening. And this is no government. Government is not playing any role. And this is happening there at the moment. So these are the kind of things, I think, which can happen and which will make renewable energy uh, you know, kind, of, uh, kind of a regular uh, mainstream. It's very important, I think, that renewable energy is not seen as a kind of fashionable or being green kind of thing. It is, should be seen as an economic, you know, feasible thing. The moment we realize that, in Solomon Islands, people pay about 50 cents, 50 US cents per kilowatt hour, per unit, for electricity, 50 cents. Now, imagine if you set up any solar kind of system, or, you know, it, it is going to make money right day, day one. It is a no-brainer. So but this is, these are the kind of examples where I'm saying that only thing what we need is kind of proper feasibility study, go get some data. Data is a problem. Uh, we do not have enough data, <clears throat> or we do not know how to access these data. And fortunately, we have just set up a Pacific Regional Data Repository. This year, it was launched in Samoa when we had the SEEDS conference. And that data repository has the blessing of all the Pacific Island countries. And hopefully tomorrow, if somebody goes there, an investor goes there, it's possible to get all the data necessary to set up uh, renewable energy systems. So things are happening at the moment, and uh, everyone is looking forward to. Uh, the director mentioned about the training part, the, the, the regional uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency centers, which are being supported by UNIDO. Now, I'm very pleased to say that we have just decided it's happening in uh, Pacific also. We call it PACRI, and PACRI is coming into shape, and hopefully in coming, coming months, we should have the center being established. It's very, very important that capacity, human capacity, is available. You can have the best systems in the region, but if you don't have trained people to run and operate and maintain them, nothing is going to happen. So it's very important, and this is where our university and our, you know, the things we do, we look after the capacity part. We say we must have this. All the, all the countries must have people who are trained, and that will be the way to go. And one last point, uh, transport. Like, we sometimes we forget about transport. 100% electricity is part is all right. But like in Fiji, 60% of the imported petroleum goes into transport, the sea transport and land transport. And we must find some kind of alternatives, like, you know, biofuel or Energy efficiency, of course, goes without saying, but we must forget transport whenever we talk about the energy scene. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Atul. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies, um, ladies and gentlemen, here um, for, the, for the debate. Pardon me? Ah, you received a question already from the international audience. So uh, here's the microphone for you. Uh, we've received a question from uh, Mr. Tobias Rinke. 
Uh, for PV, Germany paid a large share of the learning investments to cost competitiveness. For 100% renewable energy, all technologies have to contribute substantially. So who should pay regarding the uh, CSP learning costs? Concentrated solar power. Solar power. Thank you very much. So one of you would like to answer? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the question again, sorry, the, um, I think we have to, uh, so, <laughs> I am pleased if you didn't understand, so, I, uh, so we, we try to repeat the, the, the question of the, of the gentleman. Try to find out what exactly was the question, now a journalistic task. It's, Hannah. Um, since uh, Germany paid a large share of the learning investments to cost, competitive, cost competitiveness uh, for PV, um, who should pay regarding the CSP learning costs? The CSP learning costs. E Ebert? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, you can try. The CSP learning costs. I I'm learning today a lot. Okay. Um, Thank you, Hannah. It's up to you, Eberhard. Yeah, um, I can give you a detailed answer who should pay for that, but um, we, I can give you some ideas uh, how it could go or not go. Um, the success of German photovoltaic power comes from the bottom. That means we started from very few enthusiastic people who were willing to pay or invest in photovoltaic systems. Since 2000, it paid back. Yeah. But it came from a very small scale, and then it became bigger and bigger. And this is the way how most of the innovations which you can see, which emerged during the last years, also succeeded. So. If you look at mobile phones, first only a f very few people could afford it. And these few, very few people made it possible that the whole technology became cheaper and affordable, such nowadays everybody can afford a mobile phone. And that's the same with PV systems. So it's something which emerges from the bottom, this new technology. You can see this also with wind power. Of course, nobody will pay a windmill on his own, but you can see in Germany most of the investments come from the citizens who make initiatives, who have um, found very little companies just to build up one windmill. If you go to concentrated solar power, I see it different. I th there must be a different approach because Concentrated solar power is not something which you can start from very small, from the very bottom. There you need strong investors who would yeah, invest in such in who would invest millions and billions in this technology. And I must admit I do not see any investor who would be able, who would be willing to invest that amount from scratch. Because, yeah, it's, it's also not um, the advantage in photovoltaics was that it could develop during the time it emerged. But with concentrated solar power, you need directly these big investments, and the learning cycle will be much, much more costly. Because every time you need to improve, you need to build a complete new. Uh, concentrating solar factory. So I don't see any of these actors who would be able to, to invest in that. And why should they? Photovoltaic is now, I think it costs about half of the cost of a concentrated solar power system in regions which have enough sun. And uh, if I look at the challenges which we have with energy in the future, in many regions, distributed electric energy or distributed renewable energy is the way to go. And there, to my opinion, photovoltaic is this energy which, with which we can supply the world. 
Thank you, Eberhard. Before Stefan wants to participate, and I pass over the word, um, one remark. Um, as you just have seen, you can, um, now I'm um, talking to the international audience at the live stream, you can participate anytime. We try to get your um, questions or remarks into the conference, into our academy here, so Sandra and Hannah will take care about your questions, as you just have seen. And Kanike, um, my uh, flying reporter today is now going around, so if you have questions, remarks, uh, different ideas about the 100% renewable energies until 20, 2050, just participate. We're here for you and not vice versa. So just feel free to do. And now it's up to Stefan to add some words. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> one point, as, as, as this was mentioned also in the introductory remarks by, I think Imani mentioned that one, um, questioning um, where the money generally should come from. Well, I think if you look in the amount of money which is required for a global energy vendor doing energy efficiency, we talk about a couple of hundred billion US dollars annually. I don't think IFIs will be able to do that one, and they shouldn't. I mean, the money from the international financial institutions, the AFDB, the World Bank, is money to basically test the border, get in there, open up boundaries, you know, create acceptance, but the, but the bulk of money the bulk of equity which is coming in, the bulk of cash, will be from private financing in one way or the other, because the IFI do not have that money. I think let's be honest on that one. That's why we need regulation to make it easy for them to mobilize that money. I mean, the, the World Bank is investing about $8 billion into renewables. That's nice. And if that's nice, and it's wonderful. But it's by no means the amount of money we need, <laughs> let's be honest. Huh? Um, on, on, on the funding on CSP, I think, I think we have to bite the bullet with CSP that, that in fact, photovoltaics worldwide in particular, utility scale photovoltaics, not only decentralized, is cheaper than CSP. So if you have a choice, if you want to do solar, then you would go for, for, for photovoltaics. I mean, just, I just witnessed in, in, in Brazil um, the recent auctioning of one gigawatt, one gigawatt capacity. That's not trivial. For a country that comes from zero solar, because Brazil is very much focusing on, on hydro in the past, on biofuels, and recently also quite successfully on wind. They just went in as a newcomer on solar, and they auctioned, and they got the, um, the preferential bidder promised for the next 20 years to have a, to have a price um, of about seven US cents per kilowatt hour. That's much lower than in many other countries. Given that Brazil is a newcomer, but also given the solar resources, CSP won't be able at this point in time to match it, but let's be honest. Where I see CSP coming in in the future is in those regions where you need so-called large baseload power, such in the Middle East, in North Africa, where it might play a role. I mean, South, uh, Saudi Arabia is looking into that one, and once, uh, a CSP would be able to solve the storage issue, which is one of the advantages of CSP. I think then it might come in. Otherwise, I agree with you, PV has currently many more economic advantages. I mean, that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just try it again. Normal. Hello? Now, now, it, now it works. Hello? Yeah, just one shot. I, I think the major advantage of photovoltaic is simply scalable. Okay, Kanika has questions from the audience. Uwe, can you, the, we need the third microphone, is it on? Okay, sorry, we have... Well, we'll start with a comment first. Yeah, thank you for so many good ideas. I am Volker Thompson, I have been a global entrepreneur, starting in Denmark, northern Germany, and uh, I ended up uh, being in education as a global uh, entrepreneur and a person involved in education. I warn us, it is not a debate 100% or not 100%. It's really, as Stefan said at the very beginning, a question of a necessity. If I'm dying because of cancer, I will need to change my habits or I will die. This world is dying of cancer called fossil fuel addiction and really suffocating. Therefore, I would hope that this a group of uh, you know, highly spirited individuals will be in agreement. We need to never, ever put a year on our goal. That's ridiculous. The need ultimately is there today to change. If the willingness is there, I lived 40 years in Canada and we lived in a region with 100% fossil fuel. When I left, we had 300% renewable energy. 
I grew up in Denmark and Germany, and I must say, Schleswig-Holstein has easily 100%. They could have 200. So therefore, please, do not limit your imagination to a goal set at a year. I think what Stefan said at the very beginning, and a few others said, it's not about money, it's not about a year, and it's not about a technology. It is truly a matter of a symphony of all the opportunities. Each community has a different opportunity. You know, I heard of a community in Canada for 45 years, all their needs were flown in in form of diesel. Ridiculous. They were almost suffocating of so much biomass around them. It took one little generator and a little bit of goodwill to change that. So don't believe we cannot change it. It can easily be changed, but the political will and the will of the people. Therefore, a last re please, sorry, uh, you have had a lot of chances. A, a last remark is, without education and without, a, let's say, a cooperation with sustainable agriculture, uh, we, we won't make it. We have to focus on education and on the other forms of energy and food energy is in the same bad shape as our electricity energy. It's primarily junk food where we could have sustainable, healthy food. So please, no year. The goal is reachable whenever we want it to be reachable. Thank, Thank you very you. much for the impact. Just um, one thing for um, all of you who um, want the, the word next. Leave Kanika the microphone. You're the expert. She's the boss. And the microphone is a power. So you have the word. Don't, no, 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 don't. Oh, don't her, take the microphone away. You okay. have the word. Okay, she has the her. microphone. OK. Thank Can you. Can I stand up? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. please. All right. <laughs> Just don't take the microphone. I'm just asking the boss. <laughs> Everything else is allowed. <laughs> Okay. Again, you. <laughs> okay, is it working? Is it working? Okay, great. Thank you. Wonderful Thank you. panel, and congratulations to the Renewables 100 campaign for its significant progress. I was there when it launched in San Francisco, I believe, about a year and a half ago. My name is Heather Rosemary, and I'm the executive director of the Inter American Clean Energy Institute. We're based in Silicon Valley, and we work in the Americas to accelerate clean energy deployment. I have a concern about the campaign I want to share with you, and two ideas. The concern is, and this is why we have not signed up for the campaign yet, is because it appears to include large hydro, which was touched on briefly. And the issues with large hydro concern us, not just because of the off-sited environmental impacts and the resistance of the local communities to having their areas flooded, but most recent science shows that in the tropics, big dams are major greenhouse gas emitters. They mis emit methane from their reservoirs, so they're not a zero carbon energy source. They can hardly be called renewable if drought dries up the, the source of water, such as in the Amazon. Right now, we have even optimistic scenarios of a low 30% capacity factor on an 11 gigawatt dam being built in the Amazon. And that's one dam out of a projected 20 gigawatts worth of big hydro being built in the Amazon. So um, I'd also like to point out that large hydro is carved out of definitions of renewable and clean energy in many reputable areas, such as the California Renewable Portfolio Standard, which sets an aggressive goal of 33% renewable energy uh, by 2020, completely excludes hydro over 30 megawatts. Bloomberg New Energy Finance doesn't include hydro over 50 megawatts in their tracking and analysis. So that's the concern. The idea is please consider carving out large hydro, or at least addressing it in the campaign and engaging uh, the viewpoints um, of organizations like ours in those definitions. And the second idea is to prioritize storage. A couple of panelists have referenced storage. We're seeing huge scale up of storage as part of the solution, especially in California, at the distributed scale, homes, as well as um, Grid scale. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Maybe um, if, if there is a third question, we take one more and then we go to, to the panel here to discuss the, the remarks. One more question, Kanika, over there. Uh, no, I th okay. Who was? Don, I, I don't know who was, who was first. I, I, From we last okay. vote. Okay. We'll get both. 
I'll hold it. Okay. Uh, again, you, you want to steal a microphone. Yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't touch. <laughs> okay, yeah, yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Farouk Wai Yusuf. I came from the Federal Ministry of Power in Nigeria. Uh, I'm very passionate about renewable energy and its future in, for the world, particularly for us in Africa. But then when the question was asked for everyone to raise his hand, if you think it's going to be possible by 2050, I did not raise my hand. And the reason is simple, yes, that because I have a follow-up question which I hope the panelists should be able to, to help us answer. Uh, we all are aware that the issue of renewables is that of investment and technology. Uh, currently, in most African countries, particularly in our South region, there are countries which, with only 10% uh, access. And some of these countries are beginning to discover oil resources all around them. Uh, now, how do we integrate the investments and the technology from the West with the, the energy poverty in the developing countries like Africa and also look at it from the perspective of having just, I mean, resources by your side, which will be cheaper. So I'd like to hear the perspective of some of these uh, panelists. Uh, how, how is this transition going to be done with respect to the African side? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I would agree, Kanika. Yeah. If you... I, uh, I had two points. Uh, hmm? The first point related to what the lady from San Francisco said. Are we or are we not considering large hydro as part of renewables? Because the International Renewable Energy Agency clearly says large hydro is part of renewables. So let us have a consensus on that. The second is everybody talks about we're all enthusiasts, fanatics, some of us. Okay. But what are we going to do about the efficiencies of solar cells and wind turbines? And are we going to marry them into efficient storage systems? As percentage increase in the efficiency of a solar cell, will make the goal much nearer than what we imagine, to be 100% high. I mean, can we work on that? Can someone speak about the efficiency improvements? They're being commercialized, and they're being spread to other developing countries. That's all. Thank you very much, gentlemen, lady, for the nice remarks. No, uh, I would um, now open it for the... No, can we have one last question? Because I said I'd come back ah, okay. for it. Yeah. One. Yeah. Merci. Yeah, now it gets, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's very exciting to be here with so many people who are deeply convinced. My name is Helen Connor from Helio International. Uh, we are uh, very convinced, but we have to become more convincing. We have to realize that um, we need a different type, different type of energy planning if we go to renewables. Um, we have to consider that Many people have been thinking about that before we did, uh, and I would like to mention the name of Amory Lovins, for some of you who can go back to the late 70s with the Rocky Mountain Institute, who developed the soft energy path uh, using backcasting. Starting, as you mentioned earlier, we have to have a vision. We have to know where we want to go in 40, 50 years, have this 100% renewable lineup, fitted with the potential in energy renewable in the countries, and then we plan backward, starting from that vision that we have to come to today, where we start from you know below zero in some countries. So we need a new type of energy planning, and uh, I would like to talk with those who are interested because we have applied what we call the soft energy path to climate constraint, and we call it smart energy paths. We have applied it in a few African countries, and I could talk with some of those who are interested. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Now we have to stop it. Really great, uh, but uh, though we have the most intelligent panelists here um, ever, but five questions is already a lot. So, um, and it was interesting remarks and questions, and we would like to answer as much as possible. So I would like to start with Stefan. Zenger, um, yeah, yeah. what is your answer to five questions? <laughs> no. No. What, is, what is your remark to the remarks? Yeah, I think the first question was directly addressed to me, that is uh, the role of hydropower in the campaign. And I would have kind of two uh, answers to this. First, there's no doubt that hydropower is a renewable uh, form of energy. 
There's no doubt about that. Secondly, there is no doubt that some renewable energy sources, or all of them, some more, some less, need some definition of sustainability. And that is especially the case in hydropower, even more in bioenergy, I'm sure. It's not the purpose of the campaign to discuss um, in detail uh, the criteria, sustainability criteria, that is important work. I'm sure, I think, I know WWF has been involved, for example, in, in definition of hydropower, large hydropower. I personally don't believe it makes much sense to say that this is large, this is small, because where is kind of, uh, what is small, what is large. Um, there are issues that need to be, um, of course, answered, but uh, at the same time, I would also like to refer to your second question, because when you talk about storage and backup options, then hydropower that is already there is the lowest hanging fruit. You can see this in Europe in particular, where now there are new power lines built between uh, Norway in particular and Central Europe. Hydropower in Norway, nobody would say it makes any ecological, ecological environmental sense to kind of stop using hydropower in Norway, but it, it's the easiest way of storing the like wind access that Central Europe may have that Denmark has today. It's one very, very simple option. So that should be seen in context. And again, I'm not the one who wants to judge that this is uh, sustainable or not. I'm not an expert on this. I'm happy if environmental organizations and also social um, organizations are involved in this discussion. It must be there. But yeah, it is renewable. So I, I hope that is answering kind of the, the, the role, I think, uh, that the campaigner is not trying to answer this question. Also, if we start discussing bioenergy criteria in detail, then we can stop working on the, on the general goal. That is also very important, but we have other fora for this. I would like to make some remarks on the question of financing. This has been raised also by Imani, by others. I think that is a key aspect indeed. Now, um, a friend from Nigeria, you mentioned now the situation in Africa. The situation in some countries where oil is found. Um, uh, on the one hand, um, I want to say that you look at some of the countries that have already now seem to be flooded with oil, Saudi Arabia. They are selling oil practically at, for nothing. Venezuela is the same. Now, these countries, the governments have understood that when they do it at the very low price, they lose a lot of money. This subsidizing leads to nothing. And Saudi Arabia was kind of wake-up call for them was, I think it was two years ago when somebody made a study coming to the conclusion that if they continue consuming oil in their own country in 2030, they have to be oil importer. Now, please tell me, where should the oil come from for Saudi Arabia if Saudi Arabia doesn't have enough oil? From the moon? I don't think that that is an answer. And there is still and the, the um, world market price, I tried to show that. Uh, whatever you do, oil is certainly not cheaper than renewables, whether you look at solar today or wind. There is a big challenge in terms of finance, without doubt. The upfront finance is a problem. But I always like to refer, especially for many African countries, to the economic success of mobile phones, which could give us really important um, indications. It seems that in many countries, the mobile phone penetration rate is opposite of the uh, electricity access. So obviously, people found business models that every individual can have a mobile phone, pay every month, I don't know, two, three, five, ten dollars. But they don't need to make the big investment in the grid. That's been done by others. So this, I think, we should kind of try to transfer to the renewable energy sector. And I know if the investment in energy is a public um, kind of task, then it creates problems for countries which may increase even public debt. So that's why we had actually two weeks ago uh, here in Bonn, in conjunction with the UN climate change meeting, uh, a conference on climate finance and proposing that, for example, the Green Climate Fund could give guarantees to governments that set up feed-in tariff or it could be a, a, a microcredit scheme so that you actually don't need to heavily subsidize because we know from mobile phone people can pay the small amount. We know this from the very successful Bangladesh case, Gramin Shakti, for solar home systems. But what, what is missing is the guarantee. 
So what, for example, the Green Climate Fund spending five billion, spending, I'm talking about spending five billion of money for guarantees, they could leverage maybe a hundred billion of investment. That is the way we are pushing, again, this is not part of the campaign, that is what we're doing as well with the Energy Association together with other partners, but I think that's the answer. Economically, the answer is also very clear when you look at it from a macroeconomic perspective. Renewables are still cheaper, but the upfront investment, that's the challenge. Thanks. Thank you very much, Stefan. Um, Atul, then Emani and Stefan, Thanks. is it okay? This, Sorry. Yeah. I'll just pick up a point on the efficiency of solar cells. Yeah. And a uh, lot of work is being done, and, and, and the future is in thin film solar cells. Because we, as you move from silicon, silicon is, it is possible to increase the efficiency, but then you have to increase the cost, because you are looking at multi-junction solar cells, where, which, which manufacturing costs tremendously increase. But the way out is the thin film solar cells. And the newer solar cells based on Perscovite and other ones are coming up, and the efficiencies are as good as uh, silicon solar cells. So in coming days, I see a lot of, lot of newer materials and newer devices coming, which will be competing with the traditional solar cells, the ones we see on the rooftop. So I think in coming years, there will be some changes. Thanks. Thank you very much. Imani, Stefan, and then Eberhard. Sure. Uh, who wants to start? I, I didn't, yeah. If you want, Stefan, then start. Oh, okay. So, Stefan, Imhani, Imad. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> three short points um, to, to our friend from California. I mean, it might be wrong, but I think the likelihood that this is wrong is low. The Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change has done two years ago a substantive assessment on renewable energy sources, um, and they looked into all kind of potentials, advantages, shortcomings, benefits of all sorts. There's a huge chapter on how to power in there. And I must say, to my big surprise, the, um, the peer-reviewed science tells us that there is hardly, hardly any greenhouse gas emissions from hydropower. There's one big dam um, in Guayana, um, but the, um, the, uh, the estimations of other hydropowers, methane emission in particular, have been either widely overstated, overestimated, or could not be verified. Um, so that's, that's, I think, a good news. The impacts of how to power are, I'm, I'm not ignoring them. Um, there are impacts of how to power. Um, definitely in some cases, once those are not conducted according to social standards, et cetera, et cetera. So a couple of NGOs together with the industry, um, um, this includes WWF, but also Oxfam, Transparency International, and others. We have been working with the global how to power industry to develop a protocol, which is basically trying to work um, in, in implementing the World Commission on Dams criteria a little bit more, a little bit more in detail, a little bit, a little bit more operational. You will find this on the website. Uh, um, I, I can give it to you offline later on. We're still working on that one um, because there's still some open debates. But this is a very good process um, where we try to look into both. Um, criteria and standards for many criteria, not just environmental ones. There are social ones, there are resettlement criteria, rehabilitation criteria, et cetera, et cetera, um, which are not an easy for everyone to understand and easy for everyone to accept, particularly as this is a voluntary target because countries are not doing it. But we see increasingly bodies um, supporting the principle of the Saudi Power Protocol. The World Bank came out recently. I understood that GIZ, and I see representatives of the German government here, also looked into that one and might support those. Um, um, unfortunately, the Brazilian government is not doing it because, as you, as you mentioned correctly, the dams in the Amazon. Um, but we see movements there. Another thing is, which comes out as well from this assessment, which not only looks into new hydropower stations, but also existing ones, because some have a potential for increased rehabilitation, efficiency, et cetera, et cetera improvement, that also comes out is there's a kind of connotation that small is beautiful. That a small dam, or the, 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 the number of small dams resulting into whatever, 200 megawatt, um, is better than having one 200 megawatt dam. That's wrong. In some cases, if not in many cases, um, many small dams, how to power station, have an aggregate, a bigger impact on the river iron system, on the ecology, on the fisheries, but also on the people than, than, than a bigger one. That's not a rule of thumb, but it could be. So let's be careful with small is beautiful, big is damaging. In some cases, bigger is more efficient. In some cases, bigger, bigger delivers just one point of intervention, and whereas many small deliver many other interventions somewhere else. I think we need to keep that in mind. There's no kind of, you know, that's a rule. So how to power is, a, is, an, is, an, is an interesting issue, and, and um, well, we don't like how to power, but if we want to go to 100% renewables, given the fact that currently it's about, I think, 17 or 18% how to power share of all electricity, it will be difficult to do without. 
And it would be difficult, I think, to look into the emerging schemes of how to power, even if we don't like them all, the emerging schemes of how to power in many parts, in particular in Africa, where how to power is one of the solutions. Um, and I think we need to get them right. Um, I think that's before. The last point on, on my friend from, from Nigeria. Um, um, I think it's interesting. I think we need to look into the, the fossil fuel bonanza in those countries, which is not only, I mean, it's Mozambique, it's Angola, it's Uganda, and so on and so on. If you look into the, in, in, into the literature, into the assessments, then we see that there's something like a resource curse. We have seen, in particular, poorer countries establishing and, and, and embarking on a large, huge, more or less monopolized resource, in this case, oil and gas. And the word of resource curse is well known in literature. We have those countries basically, despite their being suddenly endowed with lots of potential resources and income, getting poorer. The poor are getting poorer, the rich are getting richer. Only a small part of the global elite, other the local elite, is, is benefiting. I'm sorry to say that one. My feeling is that could be the case also in, in Nigeria. Nigeria is endowed with, with billions of oil dollars. Um, I'm not telling you how, to, how, how, how you should use your money because that's, that's up to you and, and your government to do it. Um, but we know from Nigeria, which is one of the, in terms of incomes, one of the richest countries in Africa, has the lowest rate of electrification in, in entire sub-Saharan Africa. So I think we need to keep that in mind, that once the money is there, once the income is there, it does not necessarily benefit those who would need it the most. Uh, let's be careful at that one. The, the World Bank has looked, and some of us had been engaged in that one in 2007, a huge report which was led by Emil Salim. Um, they looked into the, um, the, 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 the economics and the impacts of countries being endowed with huge oil and gas resources in particular, and what that means for the economy. Emil Salim was a former Indonesian minister. He was not coming from the north. He was coming in from himself from an oil-endowed country, Indonesia at this point in time. And his findings were disastrous. Um, for those countries, in case they do not have proper governance, in case they do not have a proper income um, maintenance scheme, because in the end, oil and gas companies, mostly international ones, coming in the countries, dig the holes, dig the stuff out, at best refine it domestically, but then ship it out, and the money and the revenues is not coming to the villages. The money is then banked in Switzerland, in the US, probably in Germany, or in some kind of islands with kind of, you know, cowboy banks. You know, unfortunately, that's the case with that money. Thank you very much, Stefan. As passionate as we know you, um, Imani, up to you. Yeah, uh, I, I just don't want to get into those two hydropower and <laughs> other things. I know there are some issues in India on, on, on the social front, uh, but uh, the need of the hour is for the energy, and I think uh, we need to see how those social issues can be taken care of rather than uh, arguing against the hydropower plants and other things. This is my personal uh, viewpoint, but I, I agree with, with the experts which are working on that. Uh, I just want to pick up uh, on the planning issue. I think that is uh, more important uh, for the, uh, the local governments, which we are working with uh, all over the world. Uh, uh, one is on the awareness front, uh, which we uh, started telling them that what they should do, what they should not do. So I think uh, we, uh, the local governments need uh, expertise on the technology front, expertise on the financing mechanisms. I think that is more important rather than the finance, what I'm talking about. Uh, we are even encouraging the city governments to put their own money uh, to start working on the renewables, actually. So unless until you put your, uh, from your pockets what your share is going to be, either from the public or from the private or from the donor agencies, I don't think that is going to be uh, enough for them, actually. So there should be a, a mechanism, a financing mechanism to work into, into that. Uh, the last point is on, on, on the awareness for the communities. I think that is m much more important uh, if we talk about 100% renewable energy, unless until their contribution, the community's contribution, into the program, uh, we cannot achieve this. So for that, uh, some sort of these energy cells, which we have now uh, really looked into South-South cooperation between uh, South Africa, Indonesia, and India, all these countries, they're really looking into that with the local governments exchanging uh, uh, on various ideas. And there are also actually North to South, uh, which is, which is uh, needed. Uh, we are looking some sort of uh, expertise in Germany for that, which can be <laughs> flown into the South Asian, the South Asian and Southeast Asian countries. I, I think knowledge transfer from North to South, South to South is, is more important uh, with the local government's front. And, and, and that will help uh, the planning, energy planning at, at the local governments. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Imani. Now, Eberhard, before then I start the final round, because it's already 20 past 12, but now it's up to you, Eberhard. Thanks. Okay. I first would like to make a remark about efficiency of photovoltaics. To my opinion, we need to increase the commercial efficiency. That means what per dollar is the key issue. This was the first remark. The other one is, um, the, is an answer to the guy from Nigeria. And I think you raised an issue which um, yeah, probably is a more general issue or maybe also a dilemma. Because if we use much more renewable energies and those who do it for, from whatever reason, less conventional fossil energy, fossil fuel will be needed. That means it will probably will become cheaper on the market. Yeah? That means those people who cannot afford oil today may maybe afford it in a, in a few years yeah, if uh, any other people use renewable energy. So this is a, a kind of rebound effect. And to my opinion, probably we'll, we will have to face that all those oil wells which are active now at the moment probably will be used completely. Nevertheless, I see some hope, and this due to the following reason. I want to raise, or I want to uh, formulate a thesis which in the first view might look a little bit contradictory. So my thesis is that energy must become cheaper in the future. Why is that? So <coughs> my thesis says that that amount of oil which you can get from the ground for very cheap costs, of course, will be sold in the future. But there are other sources which need investment, which need um, running cost to get it out. And if the oil price is too high, it won't be affordable to get that oil out of the ground. Our goal should be to leave as much as oil as possible in the ground. And if the oil price is as low as possible, it doesn't pay back to get the expensive one out of the ground. Unfortunately, I made, well, I made a study, oh, not, not a big study, I looked up some data with some students, and uh, in the International um, Energy Agency report from last year, you can find a nice graph which shows how much oil is available for which price. So you can look, well, if the oil price is about $20, you can um, sell so and so much. If it is $50, it's more. If, if the oil price is $100, even more, even more. And I looked up, and if the oil price does not exceed $50 per gallon, I think it was an amount with which we could achieve this four degree scenario. <laughs> if you want to achieve the two degree scenario, I think the oil price had to be around 20 or 30 dollars per gallon. So that's the bad news. So finally, my conclusion is, I don't know what we should do about this rebound effect. Can we find a method or any way to ban fossil fuels? Can we put a taboo on it in burning oil? Otherwise, I don't see any possibility how we can avoid burning the cheap oil which is there anyhow. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Eberhard. Um, time is running out, 
but I would like um, all of you to have like um, coming back to the to the to the question: Is it possible to have 100% renewable energies until 2050 or not? Um, like um, a final brief statement of all of you, starting with Atul. Um, so um, let me um, raise a tricky question: What would you bet that it will be not only possible, but uh, will? Um, be happening in 2050? I would not say a blanket yes for everyone, like it depends. Some parts of the world, some countries might achieve that, and some countries will not be, they'll be struggling. So I would say yes or no, it depends. It depends. Well, that's a very um, diplomatic answer. Um, going to him. <laughs> so you, you wouldn't bet too much, I would say. Imani, would, would, you, would you bet on it? Or would you rather um, like to pray? <laughs> uh, I say I will bet on it. We will. We can achieve this. Uh, that's that's. I think uh, uh, the the way to take it forward, but may not be uh, straight away. Like no, no, no I'm going to there at 100%. Uh, you need to go it in a phased manner, and set like at every phase, uh, set a target, and you can be there uh, finally. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stefan Zenger. What could the uh, community um, of uh, or the renewable community do more or better to achieve the um, the, the point that Atul is right with his first guess, yeah, the yes guess? What more? Um, mm -hmm. Well, um, I think uh, we must be become braver. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm very glad that now. Almost everybody in this room would say, yes, let's talk about 100%. Now we have come to that point, that's already progress. Because just three, four years ago, and it was interesting that you asked this question, people wouldn't have dared to say, yeah, it's possible, because they would have noticed or thought that others think they are crazy or they are just not, they are idealists or whatever. So we need more of this, um, to a certain degree, also enthusiasm, uh, passion, and I think also it's not really fair to ask us in this sense what how much we would bet because we are players in that game. Yeah, we are not not those. That's how how we journalists work. We are we're never uh, fair. We yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's but that's why I'm, I'm yeah, trying no, right. to. So <laughs> yes, more kind of supporting each other, encouragement. Yeah, more of that. But we are on the way to that. Great, so um, thank you very much, Stefan Eberhard. Um, um, though it's not fair, what would you, um, well, not bad, bad but um, do you think that it will, be, it will be reached and what can all of, all of us in this room do, um, apart from being braver, to achieve the 100% in 2050? We are both from Cologne, so we know, <laughs> we know about suffering with our football club, so <laughs> that's maybe even, <laughs> even worse. So uh, I wouldn't bet because I think it's mainly a political thing and I don't know what the next elections will bring or the over next and over next elections. What we can do, I think, is first teaching the people all over the world. Yeah, um, some, I think this is worldwide a major issue. Mm. Maybe not as, that much in Germany. In Germany, people are more or less convinced of that, but the media at the moment is working against. So what we need to do is we need to enter the media, we need to um, object all these lies that are written and told, yeah? mm -hmm. and um, this is quite a lot to do, and we need to f look at the young people and need to f get the young people work together, yeah? because these are the future and they have the most bright ideas. Thank you very much, Eberhard. Last but not least, Stefan Braveheart Singer. We're talking about uh, <laughs> brave people. You have a fighter in this round, so I, <laughs> I wouldn't bet with you, but maybe we <laughs> what kind of boxing techniques would you, uh, would you take? Well, the last, time, the last time I bet this was in summer, um, I must say my heart and my brain were disconnected. Okay. I put my money into Brazil and Argentina, and you know the result was, what the result was. So, um, um, I was happy about the result, but I lost money. So this time I'm more confident. This time I'm more confident. Okay, um, whatever I would have, I would bet. I think 2050 is a little bit late, but by then I'm 90. I do not know whether I'm already happily decomposing or not. I hope not, but maybe. And then I might not enjoy 
to get the money back. So that there needs to be an early return, you know, an early and kind you, of reward. He's the fighter. <laughs> I would bet all money that it's not only possible, that's urgent, and I think it's cheaper. And I think it becomes a new mainstream. Going renewables will be the new mainstream, and it will be exotic, hopefully, to invest into fossil fuels and nuclear, hopefully. What everyone can do, last thing here, Yes, policy, of course, is fundamentally important. All is nothing without policy and frameworks. But what you all can do, as everyone here, yeah, almost everyone, who has a little bit of money, divest your personal account from a bank which still invests in fossil fuels. They are available. Do that. If one people does it, if one people does it, no effect. If 10 people do it, not big effect. If 100 people do it, they start to sink. If 1,000 people do it, they might change their investment behavior. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stefan Singer. We got now I have two microphones. If there's one like a chancellor of renewables, um, I will make your election campaign. Thank you so much to um, Eberhard Waffenschmidt, Stefan Gsenger, Atul Raturi, Emani Kumar and Stefan Braveheart Singer. Thank you very much for participating here in this very brave and interesting panel. We now go for a lunch break, uh, which is outside again, where you had the coffee, coffee first, or the tea, or the, or the orange juice. And uh, may I remind all of you, if you don't take the photo, you don't get the lunch. If you don't have taken the photo um, already and for the international community out there in the live stream make a lunch or dinner or night or sleep break as well uh, we are back here uh, with different panels at about um, 2 p.m. thank you very much uh, and enjoy the meal <laughs>